Yesterday, the comparison at the top of the ticket between Kamala Harris and uh, convicted felon Donald Trump was so incredibly stark. You have Donald Trump, who is now realizing that he's not very popular with female voters, claiming that he is all about IVF. And the problem with this is every candidate that he endorses is anti-IVF. And then he also spoke to the Southern Baptists who are vehemently anti-IVF and anti-choice. And let me play you this clip. Hello to everyone at the Danbury Institute and to all of the wonderful pastors and faith leaders, very respected people gathered for the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting. That's a big deal. I want to thank each and every one of you for your tremendous devotion to God and to country and your tremendous support of me. And I hope I've earned it because we've done things that nobody thought were possible to have gotten done. These are difficult times for our nation and your work is so important. We can't afford to have anyone sit on the sidelines. Now is the time for us to all pull together and to stand up for our values and for our freedoms. And you just can't vote Democrat. They're against religion. They're against your religion in particular. You cannot vote for Democrats and you have to get out and vote. We have to defend religious liberty, free speech, innocent life, and the heritage and tradition that built America into the greatest nation in the history of the world. I think that is so incredibly rich that he's standing there speaking to the Southern Baptists who had a massive issue with sexual abuse towards children and a huge cover up like a lot of religious institutions do. They are very anti-woman in their uh, church and in their principles that they teach. Women are su to submit, no IVF, no reproductive care, um, Ten Commandments in schools, etc. And so when Donald Trump says the Democrats are opposed to you, you're free to be a Southern Baptist. We just don't want the Southern Baptist ideals injected into government. And that's what irritates me so much right now about the religious right, because they're claiming America is a Christian nation, and it is not. It is a nation where you are free to be a Christian, a Scientologist, a Buddhist, an atheist, whatever you wish to be. Absolutely. And him, of all people, Donald Trump, who is immoral, unethical, has no character, no integrity, talking about values <laughs> goes all through me. He couldn't give two shits about religion. I mean, he held the Bible upside down and calls it two Corinthians. He doesn't have a clue about religion. He's pandering to their vote. He wants, his behavior is so abhorrent towards women that for him to sit up there and act like he gives a shit about anybody but himself, it is jaw dropping. And it tells me how easily manipulated these fundamentalist evangelicals are that they will buy in to his complete and utter horseshit. And think about it. He is just like an evangelical preacher, the prosperity gospel, selling all of this stuff, um, using um, emotional blackmail to try to get people to bend to the way you want them to believe. And so a lot of these overtly uh, religious people and their only exposure to the world is just a black and white worldview, and they can't think outside of it. They seem to fall specifically prey to Trumpism. And he is, he riles up that that base. But when you look at the whole MAGA movement at large, they behave as though we're so concerned about kids and um, we're so concerned about life. And you look at the Southern Baptists as an organization, it has been an absolute train wreck of moral depravity and cover ups from top to bottom. But most importantly, everybody needs to take a look at all of the people surrounding Donald Trump and how anti-choice they are, and how anti-IVF they are. And now he's trying to trot himself out with Tulsi Gabbard 
as the champion for women. Get a load of this clip. Oh, you hear about American women, but I hear that, you know, I don't do as well with American women, and yet I'm the one that gives them safety. I don't know if that's right or not. I, I don't know how it's possible that— So he, he doesn't understand why women don't like him. I'm shocked. And it's amazing to me that he lacks that amount of self-awareness and all of the people surrounding him do. If he could just remember right after he got elected, the Women's March was in opposition to him skirting the system via the Electoral College against the, you know, it's, which is such a relic in our government that a person that wins the minority of the vote can still be president. And so the Women's March was this massive outpouring because we all knew what was going to happen. We all knew that they intended to overturn Roe, and he did it. And he takes victory lap after victory lap. And we cannot let him off the hook on this because he's going to start sounding the airwaves that he keeps women safe. Women are a million times less safe under Trump policies. And I can tell you, we know this personally because we live in a red state with a Republican supermajority. And out of all 50 states, the safest place for women to live, ranked number 50th, is our state of Oklahoma. These policies fail women from top to bottom. Absolutely. And that, that clip personifies who he is. And is it a lack of self-awareness or complete and total arrogance? Because he doesn't give a shit. Because as he is running around saying how pro-woman he is, he is simultaneously posting on his dump truck, <laughs> low rent, truth social constantly degrading women. He's constantly degrading Kamala Harris on the basis of her race and the fact that she is a female. It is insanity. But let me play a clip for you of how well Kamala Harris is addressing these wedge issues, the sexism, the um, bigotry projected at her. She's handling it like a pro. And let me play this clip uh, for you last night from the interview with Dana Bash. But what I want to ask you about is what he said last month. He suggested that you happened to turn black recently for political purposes, mm -hmm. questioning a core part of your identity. Yeah. Any same old tired playbook. Next question, please. No. <laughs> That's it? That's it. So while Donald Trump is talking about Hannibal Lecter mm -hmm. and Boats, and then he is trotting out RFK Jr. that endorses him, that we all know rode around with a dead bear in his car and then staged it like he it was run over by a bicycle in Central Park and all of this crazy sensational stuff. Kamala Harris is a serious person that in that interview presented a lot of solutions for Americans. And what I'm worried about here is are we all getting so into politics as entertainment and that's why he gets so many clicks? I mean, you and I, I mean, we watch it with our jaws open and, and the people that are listening to us and viewing us right now. It's wild to see somebody so crazy, but we all need to revere what she just did. Everybody knows in the United States of America, if you have a drop of black blood in you, you are perceived by the white patriarchy as black. And she has been treated as such her entire life. And despite that, she had to work harder and uh, longer. And her journey to get to be attorney general, uh, senator, vice president was more difficult than it would be for a Donald Trump, who is a trust fund baby, et cetera, et cetera. And so the fact that she's I am not doing this. I'm a serious person that's talking about policy. I'm not discussing a fact. And the fact is that she's half black and she's not discussing it. I really like that approach. And I want to get your take on it. I thought she did a great job. And I thought Donald Trump craves attention and getting in a back and forth with him only gives him attention. And I think ignoring him and being presidential and thoughtful about that it shrinks him even more. And so I thought also that was a great take. That was a great way to handle it because he is so ridiculous. You just can't give it any air. Let me ask you this. 
So now that we're seeing, you know, the split screen a lot, you Mm -hmm. see what Trump is doing. And we played some of that, you know, he's pandering to the evangelicals. And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. Don't look at anybody I hang out with. I actually am for women. I actually am for IVF because he knows he's going to get hammered at the ballot box by women. They have internal polling. Mm -hmm. He's telling him which groups he does well with, which is why he showed up to the Baptist to kiss their ass. But he's also getting hammered by women. So then he's like, oh, I'm going to let the government pay for IVF. I mean, he went, (laughs) you know, now it's like IVF, a socialist program for IVF. And um, it's obviously pandering. But my my question to you is this, with the split screen coming into focus, and he is, for good, for better or worse, entertaining, because he's so batshit crazy. And Kamala has the enthusiasm, but she's also a very serious person. She's very smart. And because of the optics of her being a woman, you get a lot of distraction. If she might raise her voice or she might giggle, there's a lot more criticism to that. And she's held to a much higher standard than this white privileged man is. Do you think for the low information voter, I'm talking about an American that maybe watches ABC News, CBS News a couple of times a week, maybe reads a headline or two. Do you think they're going to fall prey to Trump all of a sudden shape-shifting and acting like he's a champion for women and saying, oh, I'm fine now because he, my kids were IVF and he said he's for IVF and he even said he was going to make insurance cover it. So that's so great. Or the government. So I'm going to go ahead and vote for him. Do you think that that's going to work with low information voters? I had that concern when I heard that because I thought he is no more going to privatize and have the government pay for IVF that I'm going to be on the cover of Sports Sports Illustrated. Illustrated. (laughs) You know, I mean, it's just never going to happen. I think you could be on Sports Illustrated. I appreciate that. We digress. But he just, he is so desperate for women's votes. And when I really thought about it, I thought this. He is destructive. He's chaotic. I enjoy it because I like watching a train wreck. I like (laughs) observing a mental breakdown every day. But I think the majority of Americans are tired of the divisiveness. They are tired of the lying. I think people generally want their politicians to be boring and thoughtful. You know, I look at him with these posts and J.D. Vance, and I think these are people that worry, that have so little self-control and hate a group of people so much that they deface themselves and are so bigoted But we want them in charge of the nuclear code. I think on some level, even a low information voter knows that somebody that cannot control themselves to the degree that Donald Trump can't. Like last night, he's talking, oh, I'm going to pay for IVF and oh, Al Capone. Shut the fuck up about Al Capone. Like, what are you talking about? Generally, I think people want boring. I think they want policies that better their lives. I think the low information voter is tired of the divisiveness. He, he looks old. He sounds old, sounds crazy. So I am hopeful that the IVF headline will not catch any eyes and that people will think about that. And I, I suspect that at the debate, we'll talk about it. So I do have the same concern, but I, I, I'm, I really don't people, think people are going to be fooled overall. I hope that the headlines from journalists are Donald Trump promises to socialize IVF despite every single person surrounding him opposing IVF. And 80% of the authors of Project 2025 are Trumpers, intimately connected to Donald Trump, his campaign, his former administration. But it just seems like there is a standard that Kamala Harris is held to, and there's a standard that Donald Trump is held to all across the country. And I worry that his lies about these things, because we know he's not going to have the government fund IVF, nor are they going to put a regulation or a mandate on insurance companies. It's never going to happen. You and I both know this. But in closing out the week, I found this uh, tweet from former First Lady Melania Trump to be hilarious. So she rolls out to Twitter yesterday. Mind you, 
all of us know what's going on, the mental breakdown with her husband that we see every single day. I mean, he's up at 2 a.m. at 2.30 a.m. <laughs> on his dump truck website acting like a fool. He's contradicting himself left or right. He's hanging out with all these Christian nationalist fascists. So Melania just takes to Twitter and she types the following. New York City captivated my heart the moment I arrived 28 years ago today. This electrifying town isn't just my home. It's a colorful canvas where dreams come alive. New York's iconic skyline and vibrant culture inspire me every day. <laughs> what? <laughs> Is that not? I'm like, Hello, tone deaf. Like, what? We know that you live at a country club right. at Mar-a-Lago, right. but are you seriously this divorced? First of all, first and foremost, everybody in New York City hates, mm -hmm. hates you. You've been completely ostracized from all social circles. Anna Winter, the chief editor-in-chief of Vogue, would not, over her dead body, would she let you be on the cover of Vogue, despite all former first ladies being on it. She would not let Melania be on it. And here, it, and then she posts the New York skyline. I just thought that was totally a window into the soul yeah. of the uh, Trump family. Yes. And just what a weird world they live in where she's celebrating, you know, the New York City and her dream came alive there. But she's kind of like under house arrest at Mar-a-Lago because everybody hates them. And do you think Melania is going to go hang out with the people that go to the Trump rallies? Fuck no. Exactly. He wouldn't. No. All right. Listen up. Make sure you subscribe here and on our audio podcast and leave reviews, comments, likes, alerts, all of the stuff. And we will see you guys on Monday. It's so